For 20 years, parents trusted Thomas Hamilton with the care of their children. For almost as long, society entrusted him with lethal weapons of destruction. In 10 minutes last Wednesday, the two worlds of Thomas Hamilton collided and left Dunblane with a terrible loss. Tonight, World in Action asks, what kind of a man could do such a thing? People in Dunblane pay their respects to the victims of Thomas Hamilton's last moments of madness. It had started as an ordinary week in the life of a Scottish community. By Wednesday, Dunblane had seen one of the worst mass murders in British history, of 16 children and their teacher. Ten survivors still lie in hospital. Tonight, the small cathedral city is suffering a loss almost too deep to endure. But why? ITN News at 10 with Trevor MacDonald. The class that died. Massacred... When news broke of the murders in Dunblane, the identity of the culprit soon spread. The perpetrator was not some unknown killer from the shadows. Thomas Hamilton was familiar to many in Dunblane and in a wider world. People who had met Hamilton didn't easily forget him. I just thought he was a very sleazy character. He came over with a very soft voice, so I didn't think that he'd be violent at all. Uh, violence didn't come into my way of thinking. Um, to me, he was more a, a type of chap who would be touching up young boys. I think he just made my flesh creep. I felt very, very uncomfortable, and it's not something I normally do. You know. My mind went immediately back to that first evening that I met him and the conversation on guns immediately and I thought yes of course the government responded quickly to the massacre what happened yesterday cannot be understood must not be forgotten it was an act of wickedness beyond imagination. an official inquiry under Lord Cullen will try to unravel the events which led to a national tragedy Was there a way to prize Hamilton away from an unhealthy obsession with young boys without tipping him over the edge? And should such men who arouse fear and resentment in others ever again be allowed near lethal weapons? The first clues to Hamilton's tortured mind emerge here at his boyhood home in Stirling, five miles south of Dunblane. His beginnings were surrounded by confusion. His father left his mother before he was born. For years, he believed that his mother was his sister and that his grandmother was his mother. As a young man, Hamilton was already seeking ways of being around young boys. In later years, more and more questions would be asked about this interest. Just yards from Hamilton's childhood home is the local scout hall. At 21, he joined the organisation as an assistant scout leader with a Stirling scout group. An opportunity arose late in 1973 when a new scout group was opened in Bannockburn. And in my opinion, I thought this would be an opportunity for Tom to realise his full potential as a leader. During my occasional visits to the troop to see how he and the boys were progressing, some evenings the programme was very well. But his scout career was abruptly ended by two disastrous mountaineering expeditions involving young boys. They had slept in an open van in the month of March in the Scottish Highlands where the weather can change within the hours. I felt it was a desperate action in that had these boys whose clothing was by this time wet slept overnight in the back of a transit van and if once again the temperatures had plummeted then I think we would have had a crisis on our hands. 
I was so upset that I did not ask him for an explanation. I just asked him for his warrant. And that was the finish of Tommy Hamilton, so far as I was concerned. Hamilton never forgot his dismissal from the scouts, but he found new ways of gathering boys around him, ways that authority found almost impossible to police. Across central Scotland, Hamilton set up a web of self-appointed boys' groups, clubs he ran under grand-sounding names. He had no qualifications to run them. One such club was in Dunblane. He invited parents up, and I think the parents were quite happy to see the youngsters playing five-a-side football, uh, taking part in activities, and seemed to be really enjoying themselves. And he was painting a rosy picture that he was uh, looking after them and looking after their interests, and uh, this is what the, the kids wanted. I think it was to some extent. In 1983, Hamilton's right to hire council premises was revoked after boys of nine and ten started making allegations against him. The things he was asking them to do, uh, the things he was doing with them and to them, and at the same time he kept on taking copious amounts of photographs. Uh, and um, the, the youngsters felt very unhappy about this, and very uncomfortable. And there were some allegations of touching Hamilton fought his case right up to the local government ombudsman and won back his club and his access to boys. His success set a pattern of parents voicing concerns but unsure how to pursue them, of authorities unable to turn those concerns into hard evidence, and of fair-minded people who felt that Hamilton deserved the benefit of the doubt when rumours beset him. He gave no impression of guilt to me. Uh, he just quite frankly explained the predicament that he was in and how serious it was from the boys' club point of view that he should continue to have facilities and if I could do anything to help him, would I do so? And I said I would. He started bombarding, I think, all members of the Education Committee, uh, as far as I know, with letters uh, with his head and note paper, uh, which seemed to indicate he was in some official organisation, I think it was called the Stirling Rover Group. Uh, being an ex scout myself, I assumed it was something to do with the Boy Scouts, but subsequently, of course, that wasn't uh, found to be the case. I think there's a, a general assumption that everybody who applies for facilities is an honest, upright, honourable person, and not a criminal. In Dunblane, Hamilton remained unpopular, but he didn't let it stop him finding new ways to recruit young boys. He established a huge network of clubs in at least 14 areas in central Scotland. Only boys under 14 were welcome. We took telephone calls from inside central region soon after the killing to say that the, the shadow of the gunman, Thomas Hamilton, didn't just cast itself over Stirling, Dunblane, but it was a broad sweep across central Scotland. He had got clubs in Dunfermline, in the east of Scotland, clubs in Lothian at Linlithgow Academy, for instance. The, 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 main, the, the, the main clubs were in Central Belt, but then we also found out that he'd come to Glasgow late last year and until a few days ago was operating a club in Bishop Briggs, which is just north of the city. When he'd involved boys in his clubs, Hamilton persuaded their parents to let him organise holidays, some in school halls, some at camps. On these holidays, something more sinister emerged. Hamilton took groups of boys as young as five. He was often the only adult in charge, and boys spent a lot of their time half-naked. One mother, whose son told disturbing stories, went to the police. Dunblane police must have um, got in touch with the Child Protection Unit at Dunfermline, and one of the police women from that unit came and interviewed my son, and I spoke to her on the telephone several times. The police women from the Child Protection Unit did know Thomas Hamilton's name. She, they had investigated them in the past, but they had found nothing illegal. On this occasion, police said there wasn't enough evidence to proceed with serious charges. But there are witnesses who could have given crucial evidence of violent incidents. The first night we were there, he, we were all sitting around the campfire getting the heat, and we were poking sticks in the fire, and he picked four boys and took them near his tent and hit them all as hard as he could with wooden spoons about six times, and they were crying hours. There was one boy in the camp that he did not like 
And I think that was what sort of made the camp very unpleasant for me. Thomas Hamilton just asked him to come over to him, and they just, he smashed him. I mean, it wasn't, I'm talking, uh, he physically whacked him, like as you would fight somebody. He really hurt the boy. The way he looked when he hit somebody, he just looked mad. His, the stare in his eyes when he hit, hit that boy, I mean, I'll, I'll never forget. It was just, his stare was just, it was so, there was like no emotions, it was just madness. He wouldn't let you put a t-shirt on when you've got bad sunburn when you're peeling. He wouldn't let you put suntan lotion on when you're in absolute agony. If you wanted suntan lotion on, he had to put it on. You weren't allowed to put it on yourself. It's either him or you weren't getting it. But if it was so dreadful, why didn't people just go home? They did. Some of the, the boys did leave. Uh, th there was many occasions the boys phoned their, their houses, their families. But because the boys are five or six, they just thought, he, they're just obviously crying over nothing, crying sort of over spilt milk. I think he was certainly a paedophile in the sense that he was interested, even obsessed, with young boys, but it's by no means clear that he was actually having uh, explicit physical sexual relations with them. He enjoyed the boys being in a state of semi-dress and that he would sometimes uh, hit them with, with birches and make them cry, and it's quite probable that he took some kind of sexual pleasure from that. Had there been a wider-ranging police investigation into allegations against Hamilton, evidence might have come to light which would have convicted him in the courts. And then, as a convicted man, his license to keep guns would have been at risk. At one camp, Janet Riley and Doreen Hagger turned up to visit Mrs. Hagger's son. Hamilton was out of control. One day, he came out with a gun and he threatened Mrs. Haggard with this gun at the camp. What did you see? I was coming back down through the woods and I seen him with the gun. And when I came towards him, he put the gun away back in his tent. He threatened Mrs. Haggard because she, she was telling him that there wasn't enough food for the last day kids there. What did you hear him telling her? He said that he was going to shoot her. When we got back to the mainland, the first thing we did was we went to the police station and told them how he was treating the boys and how we felt about him. You know, we just thought, well, he was a pervert. There was nothing else for it. And we told the police that. At that time, the women were mainly concerned with his treatment of the boys. But after further incidents with Hamilton, the women asked police to take action over his guns but Hamilton was allowed to keep his gun license. Police are investigating these allegations and are refusing to comment. Do you think that they had lodged a formal complaint? I don't think they did anything about it. I think when I phoned them up, they've just written it down and forgot about it. I don't think they did anything about it. Hamilton turned up at the house of Bob and Liz Duncan after they refused to let their son attend one of his camps. It was Hamilton's obsession with guns that was on his mind. We chatted on and had coffee in order to make him relax. Um, and that was when the conversation switched from the boys' club and um, Bob and he then uh, conducted a conversation surrounding guns. And um, I, I felt that was rather unhealthy, but that's where um, Mr Hamilton felt most comfortable. I'd spent two years in the Royal Air Force and I'd fired a lot of different things um, and could relate to him from that point of view. But, but his was a far more narrow um, approach to the whole thing. And, and he had, I think he described at that time, handguns that he had and a couple of rifles. And he enthused about those. And he enthused about shooting. And, and he could tell me that he was a marksman at X yards or, or meters. By the time he set off for Dunblane, Hamilton had built up a formidable armory, including Magnum revolvers, and semi-automatic handguns, which he would use to take away the lives of most of Primary One. Until that grim morning, he was so proud of his gun collection that he tried to show it off to children he knew. 
I seen him, and he, and he, and he was had this long black coat on, and a suitcase, and he says he says to me, "You want to come in and see my new gun? Uh, a black revolver, right?" And um, and I says, and I was asking him questions about it, and I says to him once, hey, "How many bullets does it had?" And he goes, "At twelve." He says, "Anytime you want to come and see him, just come to my house." And he used to tell us the address and all that. Lord Cullen's inquiry will have to calm fears that such lethal guns are too easily acquired by men as disturbed as Hamilton. He'd held his gun license for 19 years. The police could have refused to renew it to someone with intemperate habits or unsound mind. No one made that judgment of Hamilton. His license was renewed every three years, the last time in 1995, after police inquiries into child abuse allegations. Each renewal needed a character reference from a prominent member of the community. A local magistrate says nothing then known about him could have prevented him getting a reference. If uh, Hamilton had appeared before me, <clears throat> he'd have presented me with a parsley filled in form. I could have questioned him on what uh, the entries in the form, and from what I knew of him, I wouldn't have hesitated to give him a gun certificate, because I uh, knew of nothing against him. I mean, if a chap is accused of, of uh, sexual misconduct, if you like, it doesn't mean that he's, he would be irresponsible with a weapon. But I wouldn't know. But I would have no reason not to have pushed forward his application. The last multiple murder by a gun enthusiast brought demands for changes in the law. After Hungerford, when Michael Ryan killed 16 people, semi-automatic rifles were banned. But no changes were made to the way people get licenses. As it stands at the moment, the police can exclude a person because they have a criminal record or because they think that they're an unsuitable person, but I don't think it's fair to put the onus on the police to assess a person's character. Uh, we often require certificates of mental health uh, for people who want to adopt children, for example. Now, it seems to me that owning guns uh, is just as dangerous a thing to be doing. Calls for tightening up on mental fitness have been made repeatedly. The Firearms Consultative Committee, or FCC, set up after Hungerford, recommended that this be addressed as far back as 1992, but there was no change. I, I think it's significant that the FCC, which is a body which includes representatives of shooting organisations, was suggesting to the Home Office that there was a need to reconsider the whole issue of the psychological suitability of applicants some years ago and very little seems to have been done about it. And what do you think about that? Well, as a parent, as someone who shoots, as someone who is keen um, not to see the shooting community made the scapegoats for this terrible tragedy, I'm very concerned about that. In his hometown of Stirling, it was Hamilton's activities with boys clubs rather than guns which started to damage him. As rumours spread, he couldn't promote his clubs in the local paper. He was having an event, I think it was in Calendar. So I popped through and I said to him, you know, exactly who are you? Why do you operate on your own? So he said that he had been running these clubs for a while, lots of children attended them and they were newsworthy. So I said to him, are you a teacher? No, he wasn't a teacher. I said, do you have any physical education qualifications? No, he didn't have that. So I said, I find it very, very strange that you operate on your own. In recent years, Hamilton had become obsessed with the notion that he'd been unfairly branded as a child molester. He wrote to anyone he thought might have influence, including the Scottish secretary, Michael Forsyth. The most ominous letter was in January, when he attacked the staff at Dunblane Primary School, saying that... Teachers had contaminated all the older boys with poison. Even so, why did Hamilton, after 20 years protesting his care for children, finally decide to murder them? I'm horrified at what happened. Absolutely horrified. Uh, but as I say, I saw him about a week ago and there was no indication of uh, being an unbalanced person or anything of that kind. For 20 years, he was harassed as an undesirable person. And I'm quite surprised that he continued to live in this town. So many nasty things were said about him. And 
I imagine he was a loner. I've never heard of him having any particular friends. And I imagine that all this stuff accumulated in his mind and uh, rendered him insane. On Wednesday, the 7th of March, Hamilton wrote to the Queen. He was upset about the Scouts Association, whose rumours about him had now reached epidemic proportions. And he appealed for some kind of intervention in the hope that I may be able to regain my self-esteem in society. Ironically, on the day Hamilton's rage finally boiled over, neighbours noticed his personality had become more cheery and outgoing. He obviously had been to a shop for a paper, because the paper was under his arm. And he was dropped off in a car, which I assume someone had given him a lift. And then when the car moved off, he waved to them. And he crossed over to this wee white van and cleared the, the snow from the windscreen. And was there anything strange or peculiar Nothing. about the way he behaved? He was smiling. He was smiling? Uh-huh. He was just standing there with a plastic scraper taking the snow and ice off the van. I mean, and when I asked him, he, he just came over and took the paper and said, right, come in. Just turned and I said, thanks very much, and rolled up the window and drove off. And that was it. Thomas Hamilton was always a risk to young children, but no one expected it to be the way it turned out. For years, official impotence and lack of coordination meant that serious doubts were not effectively investigated. No one apparently thought the complaints against him might affect his right to hold guns. No officials were able to take part in this programme pending Lord Cullen's inquiry. The inquiry will have little meaning unless it reassures the public that if mistakes were made, they will never be repeated. That no hospital chaplain will again be called on to comfort so many parents. My particular role was to meet the families as they came to identify their dead children and to go through with them uh, into the mortuary and identify them there. You can understand how harrying it was for these families because those children had left home at half past eight in the morning and the next time they saw them they were dead in a hospital. So no two people grieve alike and no two people can face that kind of thing alike either. So you'd expect uh, a range of emotions and that's what happened. There were people that found it very difficult to take it at all, people in deep grief. One of the things we were able to do, of course, was to allow them to say goodbye to their children properly so they could stroke them and kiss them. And a lot of them um, took advantage of that and it was very moving. Um, they spoke to them. Uh, they call them angels. They remarked, which was perfectly true, about how they looked like they were asleep because the hospital had done a wonderful job with them. and. Although the grief was terrible, um, there was something uh, almost beautiful about it. Uh, not the grief, of course, but the way the children looked so peaceful.